So on behalf of Offit Kerman, uh, I'd like to welcome you to Prepping the Deal. My name is Marty O'Neill. I'm a principal with Corsum Consulting and the Alternative Board, and I'm going to be your moderator for the morning. Uh, in, the, in the public speaking world, there's uh, people talk about three kinds of speeches that they want to give. One they plan to give, uh, one they give, and then one they wish they gave. Um, you may have been in that position somewhere along your career. And the trick is to make sure that the one you plan to give is closer to the one you, you wish you had given, is to prepare. So that's kind of the theme for this morning, is beginning to think about this long life cycle of a, of a transaction, of a liquidity event, or a big change in life for uh, principals and companies, and what's, the, what's in the best interest for the principals and the company and the employees in the company, and how to prepare for that. So that's basically the, the, uh, the gist of our morning. The format for today is going to be a question and answer, so I'm going to be looking at you. So this is the first table that gets to ask questions. So you're looking at me, you make an eye contact and be preparing for your questions. And the, and the one in the back there, that's the second table, Jerome leading the charge of the second table that's going to ask questions. So I have a few to get you seated, but I really want you to, you came here with a purpose. You, you woke up in the morning and said, I want to learn something from the event today. Uh, I want to make sure you get your answers, your, your questions answered. First, let me make uh, introductions to the, to the board. Uh, on my far right is David Walker. Um, David's the president of Intensity Analytics. It's a small, innovative cyber products company with a patented keyboard biometric technology. And this is new for David. Um, he's recently, uh, recently just joined that organization and, incl and in uh, includes the leadership to build the leadership team, the product sales, and a successful round A. Uh, Dave began his career leveraging his uh, EE background, developing custom enterprise software solutions for the Department of Defense, vernacular for a uh, customer down the street. In 2002, following his entrepreneur heart, Dave co-founded Pangea Technologies, where, where, where that's where I began to know of Dave and his success. Uh, they provided cyber engineering, software engineering, and information technology service to the intelligence community. As president and CEO, uh, Dave built the leadership team and led the company to double-digit profits before selling it to CACI in June of 2011. So that's a seminal point that Dave's going to talk about as well. Uh, he's not just an incredible entrepreneur. In his spare time, Dave advises small business, invests in startups and real estate, enjoys sailing, playing the guitar, I've heard the CD, uh, flying, woodworking, and motorcycling. So welcome to Dave Walker. Dave, thanks for coming. Um, to, next is uh, John Scordis. John is responsible for leading Nevada's Cyber Discovery Division. It's a practice that delivers high-end technology analysis um, across the cyberspace mission. Uh, John most recently served as the executive sponsor for Nevada's deal to acquire SIGINT Technologies. So John's background is both an acquisition guy and a guy that was on the sell side. So we want to make sure we, we, we take advantage of the competency that he has in both those areas. Uh, in, the, in the SIGINT Technology deal, he worked with the two owners of SIGINT to advocate and support them through the deal. And that deal closed just recently in July of this summer, July of 2014. Uh, John joined Nevada as a role with his partner at White Cliffs Consulting. That was his firm, along with his partner, Diane Batchett. And they sold to Nevada in August of 2012. So in a couple of years, John's been through some major life changes. Uh, he was, prior to this, he was a business uh, program manager for uh, SRA and a principal at Booz Allen and Hamilton. Uh, John is also involved in a number of activities. He's a computer scientist um, by trade, and um, he's an Anne Arundel County guy, and like some of us up here at the table is a big Orioles fan. Welcome, John. By the way, they, they're first in their division. Everybody realize that? Um, joining us is Mike Mercurio. Mike's the principal and chair of Offit Kerman's uh, business law and transactions practice. Mike serves as, general outside, uh, as outside general counsel to clients on matters related to corporate and business law, commercial transaction, government contracting, technology issues, and real estate. As a strategy partner to firms' clients, um, Mike regularly counsels these entrepreneurs uh, and assorted entities all aspects of business and, and commerce, including formation and structure, uh, ownership, management and control, financing and capital, expansion and acquisition, mergers and acquisitions. He's, he's very well versed in the various issues and challenges facing companies of, of the middle market, small and middle market, and he's been represented, he's represented clients on both the sell side and, and the buy side. As, as an aside, um, a couple years ago we did a format very similar to this, and there was a, a, a young entrepreneur in the uh, audience uh, that was having partner problems, and he knew he never could have a liquidity event because of his partner challenges. And as a result of this session, he went out and fixed those partner issues. You can 
name that however you'd like it. But he fixed his partner issues, and he went on and is able to then you know, position his company for an exit, should he choose to. So something you may consider getting out of it. And on my right is, is uh, Chris Helmrath. Chris is the managing director for SCNH Capital. Uh, Chris advises boards of directors and management teams and nonprofits, public and private, small and middle size, on a, a var variety of M&A related activities. Also aligns the companies and the services they need to accomplish their business objectives. Chris manages and directs the firm's M&A practice, his expertise in M&A, debt and equity financing, strategic and operational planning, financial and transaction advisory uh, are all to, with the idea of building long-term shareholder value. Uh, he's conducted a number of transactions to well over $5 million. He's also been uh, named as a top advisor by Smart CEO Magazine. He's a Miami University and MBA uh, in finance from Loyola College. Good place, Chris. And um, he's also very active in a number of uh, regional and, and statewide organizations, and maybe in particular to some of you here, he helped found the Maryland State uh, Initiative Corporation, which is now called Cyber Maryland, and is also a board member for the Association for Corporate Growth. So I think we have a pretty good team to talk about that prepping the deal, you know, where you go from uh, in, a, in a transaction, uh, in the life cycle of a transaction. But that's just part. The prepping part is a component of a transaction. Um, I'm going to ask Chris to sort of uh, just spend a few moments taking us through and just getting us level set and ground set on uh, the entire transaction, prepping to transaction itself to post-transaction integration. So, but we're, we're going to focus today on the prepping part. But I just want to have, have Chris sort of level set us on the entire life cycle of a deal. Chris. Good morning. The, the, when Marty and I spoke about this, Marty and I have a passion for planning. Uh, my having taught it in graduate school for 20 years. And what I can tell you is oftentimes owners allow a transaction to dictate their outcome. Mike, you've seen it, right? Absolutely. Uh, and what I would advocate from an educator's standpoint today is with proper planning, you can advocate the way your potential exit will occur based on the actions that you take prior to achieving whatever that might be. As you highlighted, somebody here in the crowd did some things previously that better positioned them for the future. And what you tend to find is when you do the proper planning, and I don't mean planning by writing it down in a book, getting it all done, getting it nicely bound, sticking it on your your credenza and then looking at it three years later. I mean, the things that you're actually doing day to day that thus then allow you, when you decide to do a transaction, whatever that might be, it could be an investment of capital, it could be a buyout, it could be a sale, it could be an ESOP, et cetera. It allows you to tell the market, this is what I'm doing. And thus you can weed out the people that would come to you to help you by being able to say, you can't meet my objective. Where we tend to see chaos occur is when that company decides it's time to do something. Katie and I were teasing about it. There's Katie over there where it's like, oh yeah, I'm gonna pull out my sure, no problem drawer, and you know, pull out the solution. It's when you then go to the market and allow the market to tell you the way it's gonna work. And that's the, the predication I think I'd like to get across today is whatever your objectives are, it allows you to then dictate how the transaction goes down by who you speak to and what the outcome of success is defined as post-transaction so that when you get the deal documents from this guy, you never look at them again. They go on the shelf and, and, the, and they gather dust, right? Isn't that what we want to have happen? And it's really, it works in that way. And, and having known both Dave and, and John and, and worked very diligently with John and Diane on their deal, I'm, I'm looking forward to John's perspectives now because they spent so much time in White Cliffs building what they had, and it was really predicated on John's background and the companies that he was in, some of which I knew back in the 90s, and it, they allowed themselves to tell the market this is the way the transaction would work, and this is where we as advisors get excited because we can look and go, wow, that was successful, versus the transaction told me, and the next thing you know, you're waiting tables at the hotel in Arundel Preserve. Um, Dave and John, uh, as operators, and I'm going to ask John to keep your uh, sell side hat on here for a moment, John. Um, can you talk, and Dave, maybe Dave, you can start. Can you take us through sort of your decision to begin to consider um, selling? And so where, where, give us a little background on the company, where it was, and why you began to consider a, an exit. 
Yeah, sure. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, so I started Pangea around 2000, uh, in the year 2000. So uh, 2011, when we actually sold, it was probably about 10 years when we started into it, when we started thinking about a sale. Um, we were around 100, 120 FTEs uh, when we sold, so that gives you an idea of where we were. Um, just to give you a little perspective, I started the business. I was an engineer with seven years of experience and no business experience at all. Uh, so uh, I learned a lot as I, I progressed along, and it probably wasn't until you know maybe five, six years into to my progress of building the business that I really started learning a lot more about how do I value a business? You know, what could it really be worth someday? You know, that was uh, something that I, I started learning. And so what I would do, I was good with numbers. I was the CFO in Pangea as well. I, I kind of wore that hat loosely, but I was good with the numbers. So I, I would always kind of check, check to see where we were. And my partner and I had talked a while back when we first started before anything happened. You know, wouldn't it be cool if we got some number like, you know, if the, some number like this would happen. And so at the time this, this happened, I was doing the math and, you know, I had a good sense of multiples. Uh, and there was a little confusion in my mind about exactly how do you value a business. You know, people talk about multiples of revenue versus multiples of EBITDA. And in the reality is it's multiples of EBITDA for us. Uh, and so I've, I would do the math and I came up with a number that looked pretty interesting to me. You know, I was like, wow, you know, give, I, we, we've come a long way. We're at a good spot. You know, we have the potential at this point to, to exit and get effectively more than we ever thought we could get or originally wanted to get. And, but we really didn't know, right? You don't really know what you can get until you, you go out and start looking and you get some offers. And another big element of the decision is it's, it's very personal. I know we've talked about this a little bit up here. Is there's, a, there's a big personal side of it. After you do something for 10 years, you have to kind of decide you know, uh, you know, do I want to keep doing this for the 10 years? There's, there's, when you have a partnership, it's, it's like a marriage in a way, right? So there's challenges in any marriage or partnership that you deal with. And so you have to decide, you know, based on where you are in your life, et cetera. So all that kind of came together, if you will. And after a discussion with my partner, we agreed that if somebody came and decided to give us, you know, a number up in this area, that it would be something we should really consider. And so that's how it all started. And, and I'll, I'll end with just, uh, just kind of commenting a little bit on the planning portion is that if you, I didn't realize how fast everything would occur after you put your toe in the water, right? And, and so, you know, we wanted to just kind of look to see what happened. And once we started doing that, and you know, it was like a snowball that grew quickly. So make sure you do the planning ahead of time, you know, more, more than that. You, you can't start whenever you start thinking about putting your toe in the water. It's almost, you got to plan and then take a little breather and then go, you know, get involved in the, in the process. John, can you uh, answer the same question? What was it that sort of led you to the, the thought to exit? And then you also had a partner as well, so maybe you could talk about that as well. Sure. <clears throat> the, uh, so, so for us, I think that the challenge was, uh, uh, so my partner and I came together in, in January of 2009. Over a period of five years, we experienced pretty much explosive growth. We were uh, hiring against some very... Uh, some very strong capability, hiring against a, a capability set that the, our client, the government, did not have. And so uh, with rapid growth, we had to develop processes and uh, essentially put the company together while we were growing in a, at a very rapid pace and, and felt very good about it. And we got to a point where uh, we were sitting in a meeting and uh, we were going to have some delays in funding coming to us from uh, some of the uh, the vendors and primes that, uh, and the government that owed us some money. And we realized that the amount of money that was owed to us was more than the, the two of us actually had uh, uh, for ourselves in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, cash to cover that. And for those of you who have ever struggled to make payroll or uh, make sure that you pay everything in a given month, you know that's a pretty, uh, uh, pretty daunting feeling. Uh, so the good news is everything worked out, obviously. But it started the thought process that what would happen if we, uh, my partner and I talked about what would happen if we took on uh, investment dollars as opposed to a full exit? What would happen if we partnered with somebody? What would happen if, uh, so, so we're, we're really just trying to figure out different scenarios to take some of the risk off the table. And so uh, decided to reach out and start the conversation with a, with a friend and and have a conversation about what are the options that are available in that particular in our particular situation, 
Uh, and, and after the conversation, based on the, the desire to keep together in the exact same way we had built it, the, the capability that we had built, uh, decided that the best approach was going to be to look at the, uh, the opportunity to sell. At, at that point, we hadn't really thought through a number uh, or weren't really looking for a specific amount of money per se. It was more of what's within the realm of the possible, you know, what's out there and how, how, will, how will this work. Uh, and then after some discussions, we got some sense of what the valuation might be and uh, felt comfortable and good about the, the idea of moving forward at that point. And so uh, we started to work very aggressively to position and posture every aspect of what we were doing around two things. One, preparing ourselves for the transaction, but also preparing our staff and the people that worked for us for a big change that was getting ready to affect their lives and obviously was going to affect our lives. And, uh, and, that's, and, and, and so that's how we embarked on the process, kind of twofold trying to take care of our people, as well as trying to prepare the business for the, uh, the actual event. Mike, staying with that uh, planning theme, from, a, from a, <clears throat> a legal legal point of view, and making sure that sort of the ducks are in a row when it comes time to, as Dave said, the snowball begins to roll down that hill. Can you talk something about the sort of the pre-planning, the pre-transaction planning that maybe the pitfalls that you've seen or, or uh, challenges that you've you had to overcome once you got in the middle of some of these transactions? Sure. Um, thank you all for coming, by the way. Uh, selling your business may be the single largest financial transaction that a person may take in their lifetime. So it, it intuitive makes sen intuitively makes sense to plan or prepare to the extent you can. And sometimes transactions come to you out of the out of the blue, but but if you can prepare, um, you should. So so what does that mean? You know, in my experience, uh, most of the clients that I've represented that have been on the sell side have never sold a business before, and so. It's a real learning experience, and I've seen a, a few areas of issue that it had they had the benefit of preparation, perhaps it could have went a little easier. So, you know, I'm an attorney, so I, I speak in outline form or sound bites, and so I want to give you just a few quick takeaways. One is I see issues surrounding intellectual property at times being a problem. Make sure you know what you own definitively. You don't want to get to a transaction stage and find out that you don't own what you think you own. Hard assets are easy. You might have a title to a truck. But softer assets, not so easy. And you don't, again, want to get to the transaction inflection point not knowing that you own, especially if that's one of your key value drivers. We talked about John and, and David referenced their partners. Make sure you have an agreement or a restriction on equity too many times, and I've seen a transaction derailed because there wasn't a restriction on equity, or at least the ability to control the equity. The last thing you want, if you're the 75% owner of a company and you get a deal that comes through and it meets your criteria, is to have a minority owner, because most times in this space, or the space that these gentlemen were in, there's, there are equity transactions, and the buyers want 100%. So make sure you have the ability to control your equity. It can derail you at the last minute. And any equity issues, buyers will move on. They don't want to buy a dispute. Okay. Right after your partners, make sure that you understand your key management and employees and, and that they also are locked up or are, are along for the longer term. Restrictive covenants, confidentiality, work for higher arrangements, um, the assignment of inventions and um, intellectual property are important concepts that you should have at least considered with your key managers, key employees, because after you as owners, your key managers, employees will be the, the next level of key for your success or uh, a big area of concern. Um, lastly, understand your relationships with third parties to the extent that you can um, anticipate what a transaction might mean to your customers. Consents and transfer of contracts become important issues. Bank relationships, another third party that many times can be an influencing factor on a transaction to the extent you have real property and there's a lease, landlords. You don't want third parties whom you have no control over to impact your um, 
transaction. So at least understand what you have in place. And then on the side, I, you know, other than those four points, think about uh, confidentiality, division of labor, and expectations. It's a very trying emotional process to sell your business. You have to s run your business and keep running your business while you're selling your business. Think about if you have partners, division of labor, who's going to interact with us advisors, who's going to interact with the employees. Know that transactions take time. They're not finished in two weeks. So it's going to take time, and time is your enemy as a seller. So understand that going into it, that, that there's going to be this great big emotional thing that you have all balled up inside, and maybe only you and your partner know, and you're smiling at your employees and your customers, and they don't know. Understand that. That is a huge emotional burden that you'll have to bear for a few weeks, most definitely, perhaps a few months. Thanks, Mike. <clears throat> uh, many years ago, to Mike's point, um, we were involved in a, a transaction. We had a small little software company in Sybase. Remember the Sybase? Remember back? Oh, the technology guys remember Sybase. They were going to acquire us, and we were so enamored with being acquired that we just quit working. Well, the deal fell through. So, you know, from March to September, we didn't do any business development, and we really had to scramble. So your point is well taken, Mike, and I'm sure that uh, maybe Dave and John can talk about a little bit about that. Chris, I'm going to come to you to talk about uh, value and value drivers. Mm -hmm. um, uh, John and, and uh, David are in the similar uh, sort of uh, market segments. There's others out here in the audience that may be in different industries. Um, uh, one of the things that SCNH has to do in, in a transaction is to work with their clients to make sure that there's a fair value that you begin to talk about. What goes into uh, value drivers and, and how in this pre-planning process should companies begin to think about dr driving longer term enterprise value even though they're considering an exit? It, it really is predicated on what your objectives are as to what the value drivers become because the things that you decide to do and how you run your business will be viewed by that potential investor and or acquirer in a different way. So I'll give you an example. If you build a skill set that can leverage itself into the area that you may be working, but that could also be leveraged in a different area that is coming online, will be cutting edge, et cetera, and you spend those dollars to bring on quality, high-valued employees, not, gee, how can I get them as cheaply as possible so that I can put as much money in my pocket so I can get the beach house today, and really invest in those employees for the longer term looking to where the market is going, you've created a value driver to a set of investors or acquirers based on what you built, giving up that extra cash today, but to build it for the future. We see some companies that try to maximize cash flow today, cutting corners today, that don't allow for the longer term trajectory. Now, we can all only hope that we develop that technology that Mark Zuckerberg wants to pay $3 billion for that makes absolutely no sense so our friends at Goldman Sachs can manage your money and you, know, you can then have a jet and fly around the world with the wealthy. But the point is that's not going to happen to most of us. So you've got to be thinking about what is your objective that you're building toward. And if I can highlight for a second, John, if I can just talk about, and, and again, it was, it was uh, John's a great guy, and, and I would encourage you to spend some time if you want to understand exactly this point. John and Diane set up a model where they said, we're only going to bring in the best employees that can deliver the best in the area that you participated in. And we would sit and go, yeah, but if you brought on more employees, you could generate more revenue, which would, and they were like, no. The quality is, and this is what it's going to be, and applauding them for that, because I think you would admit that has positioned you to where you are today and will continue to position you, because you are a leader in the field in which you operate. And, and that was something that they gave up potential short-term thinking for long-term perspective. And so you've got to really think about that, but you've got to look at it in the eyes of what am I trying to achieve 
in the long run, not just what am I doing today. I'll give you an example back to Mike and then I'll be quiet. How many business owners play the game of, oh yeah, I'm gonna use my brother-in-law's buddy that we tailgate with at the Ravens to do my tax work. And it's like, yeah, I think I can cut this corner and I can cut that corner and I think I can do this and I can think I can do that. Let me tell you what, that guy at PwC, when they come in to do the diligence on you, was not the guy sitting at the tailgate getting drunk and trying to cut corners. He's or she is gonna be looking for all those things you didn't do and your value is gonna go like this, where your short-term driver didn't mesh with the long-term perspective. So you've really gotta to try to figure out what is that objective? Is it a lifestyle business or are you building to something bigger? And that's where you find those value drivers relative to what you're trying to participate in. And anybody that tells you there's this, oh yeah, here's this thumb chart. I mean, this is exactly what you're worth. We get asked that question all the time. What are we worth? Just give me a number. Anybody that does that is, is no different than just calling up some doctor on the phone and going, how healthy am I? Just tell me how healthy I am. Because it is, it's a fallacy until you really understand what you're trying to go to relative to what you're doing. Uh, John, thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Chris. Um, John and, and David, maybe we'll start with John. Can you talk a little bit about um, as you prepared your company for exit and, and sort of the, John, you're got, you, it sounds to me that you are planning on you know, staying engaged with the, with the new venture. Uh, can you talk about maybe uh, where you wanted it to land and then what was important to you as sort of your checklist? And maybe, Dave, think about the same thing. You're, uh, I, I'm thinking that Dave was going to go off and do other things. So talk a little bit about the landing spot as you prepared your company for, for the exit. Thank you. Uh, so one of the things that I had to consider uh, in, again, trying to take care of the people is that we work uh, in the, the government contracting arena is a very uh, tight, closed community. Everybody knows everybody. I'm sure everybody in this room, we could play two connections if you're in that field and we, we'd all be able to give off a list of names where we'd know each other. Uh, so uh, how you finish is actually quite important if you're goal is to continue to stay <clears throat> in the market. Uh, if it's not the last deal that you're ever going to do uh, and it's your, it's your walk away deal, then uh, how you leave things is important. It's also important for your staff. Uh, again, I, I, I come back to that thought process because that's your legacy in the business. And I think uh, trying to plan for and take care of them as best you can, uh, especially if you know that you might not be in the new uh, the new capability or the larger capability for a long period of time, I think is really important to them. It's part of your legacy, so to speak. And, and it is something that, that I certainly, uh, my partner and I considered and I, and I think about to this day. So uh, I had made the commitment with, uh, along with my partner, that we were going to stay with the business after we sold it. Uh, obviously there's a period of time where you're, you're legally bound to do that, but for me it was about continuing to build the capability that we had already started to build. And so with that thought process in mind, and, and the nice thing about, uh, as was said earlier, the nice thing about being, I had been the guy who had been left behind in a company, who had been the guy that when the owners left, I was the one uh, fighting with the, uh, the larger strategic that decided that they were gonna you know, destroy all of our benefits and they didn't really care as much about the people. Uh, it was really more about the, the transactional value. Uh, so, so with that bitter taste in, in my mouth, I thought a lot about, uh, well, how would, I, how would I make it so that our employees and our benefits and the feel of the company could stay as close to the same as it was after the transaction as it was before the transaction? And that, that took a lot of, uh, lot of thought and effort. Um, it starts to impact things. Chris alluded to this a few minutes ago. It impacts how you prepare your uh, forward projections in your books if you plan to stay with the business. If you put forward projections that you know are, you, you can't come close to making those projections, and then the company that acquires uh, realizes that you can't make those numbers, uh, they're, they're gonna be more apt to make changes to your benefits package and find other ways of controlling your costs so that they can recover more uh, because you didn't make your numbers. Uh, after after the deal. So so these are all small considerations, but certainly things to consider if your goal is to stay 
uh, part of the, the business and also to try to take care of your employees and preserve their benefits for as long as possible. Dave, how would you answer a question like that? Uh, so it's hard to answer this question in, a, in five or so minutes, sir. <laughs> but a couple of things. When we try three then. Yeah, three. I'll try three. <laughs> uh, my goal with Pangea was to build a great company. And uh, selling it was kind of secondary. And and I think that's a that's really important because you never know if the deal's gonna happen. And uh, and if you if you focus on that, then a lot of the things you do to build a great company are gonna be what the buyer wants anyway. And that kind of leads me to the landing part is 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 you know, I, uh, what was most important to me was reputation. So I used to say that I would sacrifice profit for, to manage reputation any day. It wasn't about the money. It was about, you know, having a, uh, a good company that people wanted to come to work for, et cetera. And so selling it was the hardest thing I ever did in my life. You know, it was literally, uh, it was, uh, I thought I was going to have a nervous breakdown in the middle, literally. And I, I never even got close to that word, if you will, in my life because I was a pretty grounded guy. But... The, the stress of that because you're 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 honest with your employees the entire time through. But when you, once you go through that deal, it's not you're not you're being dishonest. But there's things you can't say, and uh, not just because it's my choice, but because you know the buyer says I'm not allowed to say things, right? Because we, we just can't talk about it. So that makes it very stressful. Uh, you've got your partner issues involved and all that. But you know, zeroing in on kind of the, on this question of the landing part, you know that that is a, a huge question of how do you how do you manage that? You're you're going to hear things from the buyer of, oh, here's what's going to happen. So you're, you're hoping you can trust that's what's going to happen, right? And for me, I, uh, I put a lot of stock in taking care of everybody. You know, I, in fact, when I started the business for the first two years, I didn't hire anybody because I wanted to make sure I could keep myself employed before I got in the business of employing others, you know, because I, I felt that was a really big deal. Uh, I didn't want to offer people employment and then, you know, fail and they'd be out of a job and, you know, they can't feed their family or whatever. So uh, I wanted all my employees to, to be well taken care of. And there's two categories of challenge when you have when you sell. There's the employee base, uh, the billable staff, if you will, and then there's the leadership team. The billable staff, obviously, they want. There's, they're not generally going to, uh, you know, start cutting your billable staff when you, once you get purchased. But there's the benefit issue. That's the biggest disruption you're going to have. And, and so we spent a lot of time trying to determine if the buyer was going to be able to match the benefits we offered. And generally, if you're small getting bought by big, the big benefits aren't as good as the small benefits. They're, they just don't match. So in our case, uh, CACI agreed to basically provide salary bonuses or bumps in salary that would equate to any difference in benefit cost. So at the end of the day, everybody got the same value. And, you know, that's an area you got to work on is, you know, how do you, how do you sell that? Because at some point you're going to have to stand in front of all your employees and tell them, here's what we're doing, which, by the way, is also really, really hard. Uh, probably the, the hardest part of the whole process for me. Leadership is a whole other issue. You know, some buyers want your team. Other, other buyers don't want your team or they want part of your team. They already have that covered. In, the, in my case, I wanted everyone to be employed. I didn't want anyone to be cut. Um, so that was part of the landing for me was to take care of them from that standpoint. Everybody has a job. Everybody's getting paid at least as much or the same amount as they were when they were at the Pangea. Um, the biggest impact for uh, the leadership team, though, as well, was the culture hit when you, when you go from small to big. And uh, whereas your, your staff, they still go to the same contract every day, at least in our case, right? They, you know, that wasn't as big of a hit for them from that standpoint culturally. The, the biggest challenge, and so what we did is we decided to give what we called uh, thank you bonuses to everybody on the leadership team. And they didn't have equity, but we gave them all thank you bonuses as a part of the process. Not that it'll solve everything, but, uh, you know, we, there were, they, we knew they were going to take a culture hit because there was no way to, to, to not have that happen. And anytime you're merging into something bigger, it's going to be different. So as far as myself and landing, I didn't have to stay with CACI. There was no requirement I could have left the day we sold. But I stayed for 12 months to make sure that all the employees got what they told me they were going to give them. Because I didn't want to jump out and just let them on their own, if you will. I had taken care of them for 10 years. You know? uh, but I will tell you, it was the hardest 12 months of my life. Uh, I learned a ton. And I'm amazed at how larger businesses operate after being in that position. Uh, just 
we went from a you know, fix it when it's broke mentality to we can't make any changes. Even though, even though they all know it's broke. They all knew it was broke. They told me it was broke. I'm like, why don't you fix it? Well, we can't. And as the guy suggesting new ideas, which they even said, hey, we want to adopt some of Pangea's best practices, right, and, and merge them with our best practices. That never happened. So don't believe that if they tell you that that's going to happen because it's like a black hole, right? It's like it's, it's just too big. Even though they want that to happen, it won't. And uh, you, can, you can stand up and fight it for a while, and, and it, just, it, it, uh, it, it just doesn't go away. It's just too big. And Anyway, so I'll, I'll end there. Good stuff. Thanks. And, and I had been involved with, uh, with Dave for a long time, so I, it, it's, it's amazing to watch an entrepreneur go through these processes, especially when you put your heart and soul into an environment for a while, and then all of a sudden it's going to change. So I can really uh, uh, echo Chris's thoughts there. I watched him go through it. Um, John, can you talk a little bit about, um, now you're on the acquire side, right? And maybe, Chris, I'd like you to think about this as well, um, and, and Mike. So, so um, when you, now you begin to talk to, to entrepreneurs out there or, or founders or CEOs or owners of companies, and they begin to think about uh, you know, selling their company or, or getting involved in the, maybe sharing liquidity or sharing equity, what, what, what do you, are there, are there moments in their life, or do, are there these inflection points they come through? How do you know when you think someone is ready? I mean, what, what, is it, what does it look like? Is it all just about numbers? Is it, do, have they had some kind of seminal moment in their life that's changed? Um, it, can you talk a little bit about sort of the personal side of when you talk to a, an entrepreneur and, and the ch decisions they go through? So uh, I, I currently mentor a number of small businesses. Uh, uh, these people are my friends, and they know I've been through the process, so they want to talk to a friend. Uh, they want a friendly face to ask questions, to say, hey, you know, how does this process work? And uh, who, who can I trust? And, and, and uh, for some, especially if it's their first transaction, you get questions like, you know, is the money real? <laughs> that's, believe it or not, it's a question. And, uh, and, and, and how do you manage your life after the transaction? And uh, what do you uh, want to do with the rest of your life? I think a lot of times, to your point, uh, Marty, they, people don't, they think about the transaction as a, a, a life moment, but they don't think as much about what happens after the transaction. And so I spend a lot of time talking to people about, you know, start thinking about the rest of your life. Uh, are you going to stay in business? Are you going to stay in this industry? Do you want to continue to do the same things that you've been doing? Um, and if you start thinking beyond the transaction, I think it gives uh, it gives the takes some of the emotion out of it and gives the uh, prospective sellers some some inflection, some thought process around well, what do I want this transaction to look like, and what does it mean for me? Mm -hmm. Is this an exit for me? You know, I'm going to. Uh, sit at the beach house and play golf or, or, or whatever. Is this a, uh, I'm a serial entrepreneur and this is my first of many and I want to get out of this as fast as I possibly can so I can move on to my next, uh, next platform. Uh, it, it really depends on where people are in life. I ask questions about, I ask questions very much about that. I ask about family. I ask about where people are with their uh, children, where they are, if they're married, you know, where they are in that, in, in that process because your family has a lot to say, if you have a family, they have a lot to say with what happens next. And so not considering them when you're going through this transaction process or deciding to go through the transaction process, I would say is a mistake. Uh, so I would bring, your, you, you know, bring their families in and then you start to get a, a vision of the person themselves. Where are they in life? What are they trying to get out of the transaction? What does their family think about this? What does their company think about this? Uh, how are they viewed in the marketplace? And by the way, I haven't said a number yet, right? This is all stuff that you can really uh, glean from a, co a coffee conversation mm -hmm. for the most part. Uh, after you have a sense for that, uh, you can get into uh, a numbers conversation, a positioning from a business standpoint. But I think these other things are really critical to consider. And certainly as a sitting on the other side of the table now, there are definitely things that I look at. So one of the parts of, of, of my business that we encourage uh, entrepreneurs to go through is make sure there's alignment between your personal vision and the company vision. And when, when there's alignment there, things go really well. When there's misalignment there, you know, you are out of line and it's bumpy and rough. So, Chris, can you talk about that a little bit? When you meet a company, 
um, and they're saying, hey, how much am I worth? And, uh, and then sort of your follow-up questions are, are they ready to go? We, we all probably know a lot of bankers. It'll take sort of anybody to market. Mm -hmm. SCNH is not one of them. Um, what, what do you talk to these folks about uh, when they, it's, whether you know this is right for you to go now? The very first question I ask is, are you running from something or are you running to something? If you're an entrepreneur and you've built something and it's your baby, why would you give it up? And one of the first questions, so I'll use John again as an example, it's, hey, you're too young, what are you thinking about? You know, what are you, you going to go do with your life? And what it really gets down to is why. Because guess what? That buyer or investor is going to ask the exact same question. If you're 35, 40, 45 years old, the vast majority of people in this room, and you're looking to sell something, Shouldn't you be asking yourself, if this is so good, why are you leaving it? And if it's you're running to something, I need a bigger platform to be able to carry out the goal that I was looking for, and my skill set only allows me to get to a certain point. Or I need additional capital because I don't have the reach to be able to develop a product line or a sales channel or a supplier relationship, what you try to avoid is I'm running from something. Because if you're running from something, then there's a problem. And that becomes an issue. And so you've got to try to figure out that very, very quickly. And if that owner can't describe that, it's not something we want to get involved in because then you're going to be dealing in chaos and emotion and, and passion that you're not going to be able to manage and control. And it's when those owners can articulate what that is they're running to, then you can determine if it makes sense to help somebody to achieve that. I mean, Marty, that's what you do. You help them figure out, what am I running to? And then you have that plan. It goes back to the very first question. So that's the first thing that we try to figure out. And then everything else can potentially fall in line, whether that be valuation, who should I be talking to, how should I structure the deal, Etc. because I will guarantee you this, whether you're an advisor or you're thinking about this, that last night before you sign a document, the things that will run through your head and force you not to be able to sleep will not be money. It will be something else. And everybody looks at me when I tell them that, and I've been doing this a long time, I've got more gray hair than most people in this room, and they say, no way, that won't be the case. And damn sure, right, Mike? How many times have you and I had these conversations where it's something else and it's not the money? And if you don't know what you're running to and you don't have your objectives and your, your position straight, then how can you deal with that voice in your head to be able to determine if this is the right thing? And that would be the number one piece of advice I would offer to you is in that planning, know what you're running to. Because if you're running from something, figure out how to solve that. Because to get guys like us involved, he might be able to help you, but that's not my world is helping you to do that. And that's something I think is, uh, in our world, that's the very first question we ask. There has to be some questions from the audience that we, uh, we want to make sure we address as a group. Uh, we can certainly, we're going to be able to hang around and talk afterwards. But yeah, yeah, I was going to say, I'm I sorry, Mike, absolutely. <clears throat> just, uh, just to sort of um, underscore what these guys said, you know, life, life happens and our businesses are comprised of people and the human capital is probably the, the, the large, the paramount to the success of your business. And, you know, people, life changes do happen and, you know, where you start at day one may not very well be where you end up in year 10. And I think, Honesty amongst partners, honesty with key employees to make sure everybody's pulling in the same direction is really key to optimize whatever your value drivers are. And so it's okay to, to think about other um, options for exit. You know, consider your universe of options. Marty alluded to it earlier. Perhaps it's a partner buyout. One partner wants to continue, one partner doesn't. If you're not on the same page, it doesn't help anybody's efforts to not be optimized. Maybe it's the sale of a part of the business that's a good piece of the business, but it's a distraction for what is your core mission. So 
I would say that, you know, nobody has a crystal ball, and, and, but I can assure you that life does happen. People get married. People get divorced. Sickness does happen. Things happen. Life changes do occur. So in that regard, make sure you consider universe of options and uh, don't be afraid to act on those uh, when life presents itself. And I'm just going to say, can we switch for a second and maybe look at the, the buy side? Sure. I, know that it's, I don't know if it's off topic. Uh, you know, our firm is going to make a concerted effort to <coughs> enter into that many space and look for other firms smaller than us to merge with, to acquire, to partner with. Mm -hmm. That's probably the terminology that we'll use. You know, are there some tips and tricks, you know, the challenges that you guys face as sellers of your business? Are there things that we can do as acquirers? Uh, that would make us a more attractive purchaser or partner. Not sure the folks in the back could hear that, but uh, the question was you know, on the on the buy side. What what uh, can, what can the buyer do to be a be an attractive acquirer and making sure that a, a, a transaction runs smoothly? I'm going to ask Dave to start with that because we had a fun conversation here. I was acquired once by Boeing, uh, so I was a 90 million dollar company acquired by a 50 billion dollar company. And uh, I worked really hard for like three weeks presenting a whole business case on why we should keep our old benefits package and not give away our recruiting and our contracting. And I went to Chicago and I briefed these folks and, the, and you know, all in the best effort. And they just looked at me and said, well, yes, thanks for coming by, but we're 50 billion. We just can't do that, you know? Um, so f overnight, my business went from a, 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 a multiple of labor, how much it costs us to do business, from a 1.8, in other words, our labor times 1.8, two labor times 3.2. So we were uncompetitive in one day be because of the, and Dave was talking about this earlier, it's, it's one thing to acquire a company, it's another thing to integrate it and then increase values. There's a lot of M&A studies on uh, one plus one in the M&A world, many of the professionals think that's gonna equal three, but generally one plus one equals 1 1.7, 1 1.8, <laughs> you know, it's hard, it's, it's hard sledding. Dave, talk about uh, the challenges you see when larger companies take on smaller companies. And maybe from, from Andrew's point of view, what, what should a middle market company really think about when, they, when they're uh, trying to acquire a company? So I'll give you a good example of, uh, in my situation, the, uh, when, I, when I first, uh, and it was met CACI, they, they made the effect, I believe it was the CEO, um, maybe the president came and said, we're really good at acquiring businesses, Dave. You know, we're really good. We've done tons of this, you know. This is my first time selling, so I, I'm going to believe, you know, okay, your guys are pretty good at this. And uh, so looking back at the whole thing, the, the, for them to buy us, to getting to the sale point, they, I thought they were very good at that. They, they had their, it was, it was pretty well uh, laid out. They, they, they've done that a lot. We got to the finish line. But then they dropped the ball. There was no integration. And it, because they're corporate, right? So the recruiting element of my business needed to be taken over by corporate khakis recruiting. The, uh, the contracts needed to be taken over by corporate khaki. So I'm no longer in charge of any of that stuff. I was technically still running Pangea, but I was effectively running the, like the, the program management shop, if you will, of, of, of Pangea. And all the things that were corporate in my world, uh, were, that I led in my world, like contracts and, and recruiting, went off to be owned by corporate. Well, the problem, there was no handoff. And so I had 35 contingent hires that they lost because nobody in recruiting called them after we were purchased. Now, if you go talk to them, they'll say, well, yeah, we screwed up. You know, uh, Now, I don't know if they'll, they'll admit that they screwed up the integration part, but to me, they left a lot of value on the table because they didn't do that. Uh, you know, I had my employees motivated to work at 100% you know, as soon as they walked in the door there because of how it operated, it's almost like, you know, well, you're getting really 60% from them now because, you know, you're not really leveraging all that that you bought. Um, you know, I think, you know, being empathetic to, if you're large, you have to be empath empathetic to the fact that we're small, you know, this is my baby, I've had it for 12 years. You know, how do we, how, how can you help me take care of my, my folks? Uh, you know, I think that's useful. Again, when you're super big, one of the things they told me they were going to do, I'll give you an example, is, is that the, uh, when we were merged, I wasn't able to go into that new organization and, and talk to the whole group and say, here's what we should do, right? Because 
you know, I'm, I'm the new guy <laughs> that's coming in. There's a, another boss there that he and I were working on this. In my opinion, what he needed to do, and this is all part of integration, is mm -hmm. he needed to sit down with everybody at that point and say, hey, we just acquired Pangea. We're going to adopt some of their best practices, and we're going to merge them with ours, and we're going to work together and create something brand new that's going to be better mm -hmm. than what we had before. One plus one is three. But without that push or support from that person on that side after the fact, none of that happened. I couldn't make it happen. I didn't have the credibility to make it happen. They just saw me as some guy with a bunch of crazy ideas uh, and just go away. You know, that's, that's how I was viewed. Very frustrating. But uh, anyway, that's... that's so, so John, um, if anybody watches uh, PBS, there have been a Roosevelt series going on, and of course Teddy Roosevelt was famous by saying, you, you know, you have to give credit to the man in the arena. Well, John, you're still in the arena. You've just gone through an acquisition. Uh, tell us about some of the things that you're doing. Number one, you, you had to be an attractive for uh, a target to say yes to you. You're, you're not Boeing. You're not huge. Right. Uh, you had to be attractive somewhere. What did, what did you do to be attractive, and then what are you doing to make sure the integration is successful? So... In the conversations with the, the two partners that, of the company that we recently purchased, we spent, I spent a lot of my time as the uh, executive who was going to be bringing them into the business talking about how we could preserve their culture. Um, first, it was important for me to understand what part of their culture was important. Uh, with many of the companies, if you have a younger uh, workforce, culture is everything. You know, if they don't have that same feel, they're going to go somewhere else where they can relate to the culture. And so... Uh, I spent a lot of time with uh, our guys saying, tell me what's important to your people. Uh, is it just numbers? Is it their salaries and their benefits, which obviously is always extremely important. But believe it or not, uh, there are other things that are uh, involved. Uh, are you a social company? Do you have happy hours? Do you do group get-togethers? Uh, how do you communicate? Do you send out an email on Fridays telling people how things are going with the company? Do the executives ever walk around and talk to the employees? Some companies, some people want that. Some people don't ever want to talk to the, uh, the executives, but I find that that's becoming less and less of the case, and more and more people want that personal feel where each of your employees wants to feel like they can talk to the owners and the leaders and have some level of, of connection to them, and that's really important to them. So uh, if you're going to – so one of the things that we've tried to do uh, that we're still doing because we're in the process of integration right now is – we, we kind of prioritize with the, the former owners what's, in, what's important to your people, and then we're working to, to make that happen. Uh, one, comment on, one comment on integration is there's a cost to integration, and I think uh, in terms of the honest adult conversations that need to take place, there really needs to be uh, an honest, you know, the, the encouragement I would have now from being on both sides is have that open and frank conversation about what's within the realm of the possible on the benefit side. If it's completely impossible, uh, you know, Dave talked about there are different things that you can do as a thank you to your employees uh, or different, maybe there's new benefits that you can bring to the table that will offset some of the losses from some of the benefits that matter to them. But you, you're going to need to be, uh, as the acquirer, I can't wait. I have to be proactive in getting this message out to the, the people that we've just acquired so that they feel good about, one, being part of this new family, and two, feel like uh, they're connected and that we care about them, and this just wasn't uh, a dollars transaction for heads. Another question. Can I, can I add yeah, please, one, one thing uh, to your point, Andrew? Uh, on the buy side, no, nobody wants to buy a dispute, right? I mean, when you're a buyer, you're not looking to buy a problem. And so what David and John said are the two keys, integration and understanding cultural matches are the two keys. And where does that tie to the legal? Well, many of the deals, of course, have earnouts, holdbacks, set-asides, escrows, all sorts of things. And if you're not marrying cultural culture and you're not integrating, the seller, so taking it back to the seller, may feel like they're not getting a fair shot at being able to meet those targets so that they can fully realize their purchase price. So when you're structuring deals and you are having uh, incentives on the backside, making sure that you do – what are these really important things? Integrate early, understand the cultural things so that the selling parties can feel like they're getting that proper resources, the proper shot, so to speak, at making their, their targets so that their monies on the backside can flow through because it's a big area of dispute. Of course, nobody wants to dispute. It's the largest area of dispute, frankly. The, I was gonna say, I'll just give you, as the guy representing the sell side guys, the best buyers are the ones that can articulate who they are 
in what they're looking for. Unless you want to be the drunken sailor that says, come one, come all, I've got money flying out of my pockets and I'll just give it to anybody. If you do that, you'll attract the people that are running to what you offer and you'll find that that marriage will work. If you believe that dollars won't be the thing that keep them up at night, and then you'll find it's easier to integrate because you're all on that same level versus on this. And <clears throat> just having gone through a number of these, both kind of, kind of on the periphery, uh, when you speak to a guy like John, it's obviously he's very passionate about the culture and the environment. And if you're a CEO that that's attractive to, you're going to gravitate towards John. If you know, we just watched a transaction in Northern Virginia, where where um, the company made the the exit at the same time that the acquiring entity was actually on the cover of a magazine with the CEO's title of "How to Slash and Burn Your Way to Profitability." <laughs> Literally at the same week of closing. So um, the, the, the decision was, was pretty much financial from the, the principles of that organization. You know, they got a good deal. And, and, um, but it's going to be hard now to integrate because they've got so much baggage to sort of get through. There's other questions here. Uh, we want to make sure we get answered today. Yes, sir. Jerome. Uh, I think we've talked a lot about successful deals, but have you ever seen examples of deals that weren't able to really close maybe the Entrepreneurs had to go back and regroup and really think about their approach, and maybe they were successful on the second or third time around. Got right up, got right up to the altar, Chris and Mike. Can I time that real quick? Yeah, David. And maybe how the pre planning could have fixed Yeah. Good. Well, I can, I can share one example of uh, you know, a world event that impacted the deal, and so it goes to the the point of keeping your eye on the business. I had a client a few years ago that was um, part of a, a, a roll-up plan by a Japanese company that was purchasing three or four like-situated uh, companies in the States here, and we got about two weeks to closing, and the, the tsunami hit in Japan, mm -hmm. and it wiped out the mother company's facilities, which put their ability to make acquisitions in the U.S. on permanent hold. My client didn't uh, had could taste the the freedom and the money and what have you and lost some of his uh, passion for his business and the deal fell through and he went bankrupt ultimately and it's a terrible scenario and you think the Japanese tsunami is way across the country or world and why how could it affect here but it, it did it impacted us here so you got to keep your eye on the business one other thing I'll share that is not directly answers your question I think for a moment but I can tell you that every sell side deal that I've done, there comes a time in the transaction when the, there's a bump. There's a hiccup, there's a bump, and the deal's off. And, you know, both parties kind of go their separate way. And you have to be prepared for that when you're selling your business. And more often than not, you find a way, because there's deal momentum, you find a way to, to overcome that. But, but that can be a very stressful weekend or so if you're the seller when you know your deal is off and I just can't, I can't bend here or the buyer's being so unreasonable there. So, you, you know, I would encourage sellers to consider that um, and, and not allow those hiccups to derail their transaction. But also, on the flip side, not to allow fatigue of the transaction to push them into a transaction that's not good for them. Where we see hiccups are when you have family members that, oh yeah, we all love each other, we get along, it's all great, until it's now, it really lays it out. And they typically won't have these discussions, although they'll tell you they have. And money, unfortunately, will tear families apart faster than you can imagine. That's where we see it happen, if it's gonna happen more often than not. And think about the concept, if you were selling, I'll just pick a company, IBM, you're not going to have the personal issues because it's not personal to them. It's, you know, what is the number? Do the shareholders approve it? Boom, it's done. But when you get down to dad started it or grandfather started it and it's now brother, sister, or cousin, and you get in, I mean, how many of those have you seen, right? Where it then gets really screwy. If you can get them to meet with guys like this to really help you think about what it is so that you don't have that hiccup, you can say it all day long and they'll tell you that they've done it, but that's where we see hiccups when we see them. Yeah, one other thing, I had a situation last year, this is, uh, I guess, a learning point that I uh, came 
uh, true to me or a reflection on, in my thoughts was I had a client last year that was selling his business and we were moving forward in the transaction, but the seller, in hindsight, never committed to the transaction, never committed to the deal. If you're going to get involved in a transaction, you need to commit, and meaning when buyers start asking for due diligence, you want to give them their due diligence. You don't want to just leak it out and hold things back and play games, and this seller in particular did that, and the deal tanked, and it did not come back. So, you know, it's two feet in if you're going to sell your business, I think. Uh, commit, you know, do your diligence work with your advisors, figure out if it's the right deal for you, and once you do commit, commit all the way. It doesn't do anybody any good, including that person, uh, any good to you lose three, four months of time and, and not have a deal close. John, can you share a little more on that? Yeah, so two things on the buyer side, to if you're, this, if you're on the seller side, that you should be looking at it from the buyer, is uh, asking about the funding available. Uh, one thing that you don't know when you're on the sell side is, where are they with the banks in terms of how much cash they have on hand? Are they going to have to raise equity to purchase you? Uh, is that going to delay the deal? It could kill the deal. If you're under a deadline, a real deadline, not a perceived deadline, that's a real concern for you. So I know uh, the, the, the team that helped us, that was definitely something that we spent time talking about. And it, you're going to have to revisit that question because asking the question, <clears throat> I was talking to somebody about this the other day, Asking the question of the buyer, you know, do you have money to acquire us? Uh, the answer is always going to be yes. Uh, the, 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 whether it's they're going to have it in the time frame that's needed for you to close on the date that you agreed to, that's a separate question. And, and uh, I'm sure Chris and others can speak to that. And then the second one is, here's, a, here's one if you're going to be bought by a much larger company, a strategic. <clears throat> if they're in the process of, <clears throat> excuse me, acquiring companies, Find out what their record of uh, success in terms of their integrations has been. There are times, uh, we, we saw a deal fall through recently uh, because the company was acquiring so rapidly, their corporate offices stopped a deal that they really wanted in the middle of it because they recognized that they hadn't successfully integrated the other pieces uh, into the business. So they simply said, corporate said, hey, stop the deal. I know you want these guys. I know they're going to help you in your market, but we're not going to move forward on this until you've shown us that you can make these other deals that you've already acquired work for you. Reading your resume, uh, um, John, I think I remember that might have been part of your background too, somebody in that space. Right. Hey. David, share that? Maybe? Yeah, just a, just a quick comment on that. I want to tie it back to the first question uh, where we talked about, uh, you know, thinking about should I do this or not, should I go down the path? And the one thing I want to just reiterate is I think you can never always remember that the deal may not happen. So you can't, you can't stop running your business to do all the due diligence and stuff. You have to keep running your business pretending the deal might not ever happen because of all the bumps in the road. And there's 8,000 reasons why the deal won't happen. And uh, you know, we've already alluded to some of them here. And, and so that, that, that's part of the challenge with getting through the process and getting to the, the end zone, if you will, in my mind, is, is because you're trying to run the business and keep it moving in the right direction and do that. You know, and, and it also factors into your decision process as you're going through because, you know, you might be thinking, well, I got some offers, they're pretty good, but what if I waited a year? Where would I, where would I be there? I'd be better. I mean, generally you're selling when you're going up. That's when you want to go have the conversation, which makes it even harder to go have the conversation. But the best time to present is you want to convince people you can grow and, and that you are growing and that with them, I can grow even faster. And... Uh, so what's going through your mind as you're trying to evaluate going through the process is, you know, do I wait? You know, and I look back at my situation, and I had this discussion with my partner, you know, because we were like, well, what if we waited and did this or did that? And we decided, you know, this is a good number. Let's do it. And had we waited, in my opinion, I think three years later, I would have got a less, I wouldn't have got as good of deals, you know, because we had the whole issue, which none of us could have predicted. You know, the government came in and started slashing rates. Oh, I want down by 20%. That's going to dig in the bottom. There's all kinds of things that can happen that, that we can't predict. So, uh, you know, I think it, it, all those bumps, just keeping in mind that there are bumps in the road and you may not get there just because you find someone interested. Uh, and, and keep running your business. And, um, you know, that way, worst case, you still have a good business if it doesn't happen. Do we? Yes, ma'am. Uh, so, John brought up the, the topic of financing and my question actually might be geared more towards Mike or Chris. Um, a lot of financing for these transactions comes from the commercial banking community, which is now um, under a huge new wave of regulations. You've got 
year and a half ago, the FDIC, the OCC, and Federal Reserve Board came out with new guidelines that limits uh, senior debt to EBITDA to no more than three times and overall leverage no more than four times. So given that, how does that affect really the certainty of closing a deal? Uh, um, I'll give you a perfect... John, you want to jump on that too? Yeah. The, the, Katie knows how to get my blood pressure up on regulation, but the um, but I won't go there. We have a deal right now that we're doing. Um, we had 12 LOIs, whittled it down to four, negotiated, and the ultimate winner, albeit a private equity group, said we will fund it with all cash, with no financing, and that after the deal they will go back and refinance it is how they solve that problem. Because we let them know we weren't going to play the game of how do I get the right capital structure and the right deck in place? It was, no, you're going to write a check. And this is a $100 million transaction. And they agreed to write the check. Write, and I don't care what they do after that. They can go figure out with the banks and et cetera afterwards. And that's kind of the tack that we're starting to take so that we don't get caught in that situation. Anyone else on the panel like to address that? Uh, I would just say that it, Financing contingencies are, are one of the ways buyers, of course, can can back out of a deal, and, and it may be appropriate. But be aware of all the other contingencies that may be out there. And from the sell side, of course, you want to try to eliminate or at least reduce those contingencies. So getting an all-cash deal uh, is, is a great thing as a seller because, you know, monies that have to come on the back end or if you have to wait to – your buyer can get financing. You may be three months in to find out that they can't finance or can't get the monies to close your deal. Now you've lost, you know, some money and some time and maybe some opportunities. So try to limit the contingencies as much as possible at the outset. And it, it's happening all the time. And to John's point, um, I recently had a, a coffee with a, a, an acquiring entity, and uh, they had just acquired a company, and the the uh, financing actually fell through, and they were literally scrambling the days before uh, to pull together money for the deal. So, um, and, and no one, out, no, the, the selling entity never asked the question, mm -hmm. you know, can you finance this? So, David, maybe last question, and we'll wrap, begin to wrap up. You know? um, Chris, maybe you can talk a little bit about what percentage of deals you see that have earnouts structured into them, and how you prepare the seller for the concept that I don't just get my $10 million check on day one. If some of it comes today, but some of it comes out at a time. Go back to the objective. John, or, you know, think about the deals you're looking at now. Have you ever seen a projection that doesn't look like a hockey stick? <laughs> <laughs> That's what I thought. Right. So the, it, it really is about what you're trying to, if you're selling the future, and you're going to tell me that three years from now, it is going to be absolutely off the chart and you can't show that the predictive analytics back that you've already done it, and you've already been growing at that kind of a growth rate, then you've got to be prepared to put your money where your mouth is and be able to do that. And then it gets into you know, good counsel on how do you structure it so that you still as the, as the operator, in this case, let's say it was John as the operator, still has the ability to make the decisions to be able to effectuate that growth and are you comfortable in that risk trade-off? Because think about it. If you're going to tell me that tomorrow you're going to be three times greater, but you're not willing to stand behind it and say, I'll put my money where my mouth is, and I'm going to take that risk, i go back to running to, running from. And that's where we spend a lot of time, where the owner might say, look, this is kind of what I'm doing. This is where I'm at. I'd rather stay away from earnouts. Well, then your valuation expectations or objective in the deal might be vastly different. And it's really understanding that up front and knowing that, you know, and, and, and council will be able to talk about earnouts can be very, very tricky and what can and can't be controlled. So it's really getting in the mind of that seller as to what is it that they're hoping to achieve. And in some cases, it's go raise the money, bring some capital in, achieve that growth. And if you can then do it, sell, because you'll be in a better position economically and you'll be able to maintain that control through versus selling to somebody under their guise of what that growth might be able to be. And, and Dave, just to tie that in, it, you know, because if you merge into or are acquired by a larger company and you lose some of those controls, then I would think you would want your earnouts, if you truly think that growth is there, to maybe be sales driven earnouts as opposed to even dot driven earnouts because you can't necessarily control the overhead <coughs> cost structure that the, the larger corporations go through. 
Yeah, I mean, just <clears throat> anytime you set up goals, you want to make sure <coughs> whatever goal you're giving somebody, they have the authority to make happen, right? So um, one of the reasons we liked the khaki deal, there was no earn out. Uh, it, it made it, uh, you know, because that was a, a concern as, as, a, as a seller. How am I going to deal with that going into a CACI? Uh, <clears throat> Talking to a number of sellers over the years, they sometimes will say, you know, I, I'm, making, I'm basing the deal on the base deal and the year now it's funny money. If I get it, I get it. Mm -hmm. um, so that, but they're basing their emotional and connection to the deal on the, on the base money. And one other comment on that, you know, if being a seller, one way that to, to help me understand would be to look at the value of the business now. Because if you're selling the value of the business that hasn't happened yet, right, that's a risk we all, we're all taking, right? So if I look at what's my value of the business now versus, okay, I'm going to pay you for what the, the value of the business is going to be in a year because you're telling me it's going to be over here, right? You're, then I want to make sure ideally I'm going to get the value of the business right now and then this is at risk, right? The, what's really at risk is the value we're putting on what we both, or what I'm telling you I think I can do, right? And because that hasn't happened yet, so that's easier to sell to me if I was the seller. You know, I'd want to know, what is the, what's the value of my business right now? Now, what I did at Pangea, and this is, you know, generally they looked at the trailing 12 in EBITDA, right? And uh, obviously you want to try to sell looking forward as best you can. What I argued is I sold looking forward with no growth because I had such a high run rate. I was hiring, and when I was small, you know, my EBITDA doubled. So if I looked back 12 and I looked forward 12 with no growth, my EBITDA doubled which doubles the value of my business. That's huge, right? That's, that's a huge different number that you would get on, in a multiple scenario. So I sold looking forward 12. That was what I aimed at, but no growth. So I took out the risk of, if I don't hire anybody in the next year, this is, my EBITDA will be double. Anyway, so there's, there's things you can kind of break it up, sometimes helps. So we're going to wrap up. Um, we're, we're going to hang around. The panel, I'm sure, is going to be hanging around for a little while for questions. Please feel free. I think it's, it's, a, it's an awesome exchange. So let me just kind of wrap up if I can. We talked a little bit about uh, deal momentum, and Dave started off as saying, once this thing gets started, it's many times it's difficult for a, an entrepreneur to, to pull away. And then Mike said, don't forget about the important things, especially intellectual property and equity. And make sure that's all buttoned down in the sort of the, the pre-transaction planning. Uh, we talked about value drivers and what was important for your organization to make sure that you're focused on what's going to drive value. And then, and then sort of uh, John overemphasized a great deal about sort of doing right by the employees. You know, where are you going to land? Where are you going to position the company for a landing? What's right for you and the employees? Um, one of the, my takeaways here was I want to make sure that you're running to something and not running away from something as you, you create your uh, exit strategy. And then we switched over to a little bit of the buy side, and uh, uh, it was important to sort of, as an acquirer, to, to be attractive and for a seller to be picky, make sure they can not only make the deal happen, as David was talking about, but as John saying, make sure that they can actually integrate, because it's, it's not easy. And then we wrapped up with sort of like, things do go bad, right? Things happen. Um, one of the rules that we always had for the, involved, the, the transaction I've been involved in is that deal conversations happen after 5 p.m. and on weekends. If you can kind of follow that rule, then you can run your business during the, during the week. After 5 p.m. on the weekends, you, you play around with your deal. So <clears throat> that's kind of the wrap-up. I want to thank uh, Chris Helmrath from SCNH Capital. I want to thank Mike Mercurio from Offit Kerman, John Scorda from Noveta, and David Walker uh, for participating. I want to thank you guys for being such a great audience. Uh, hang around and have coffee and finish up the snacks. We're going to hang around and, and uh, answer any questions that you may have. So thanks very much.